The text for the sermon this day is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 29, which I'll read in a little bit. You may be seated. Grace, peace, and mercy to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. To start, what I'd like for you to do is take out the hymnals out of your pew racks. And we're gonna, I would like you to open up the page X, XIV, Roman numeral XIV. If you get to that page, you will find what are known as the lectionaries. All the churches throughout the country, around the world, throughout the ages, we have followed a schedule of scripture readings. So every single Sunday, we have an Old Testament reading, an epistle, and a gospel. This goes through with the, what Scripture tells us to do is to pre teach, bring the teachings of the prophets and the apostles. Now, we are under the three-year lectionary, so there's a Series A, Series B, Series C. If you turn to page XVII, <laughs> sorry, so if 18, Roman number, numeral 18, you'll find Series C. That is the year we are under right now. And so year, Series A focuses on the Gospel of Matthew. B is marked with cameos from John. And then C is Luke. Now, what Sunday is today? See if anybody's paying attention to me. Yep, Epiphany 7. So if you look down to it, you see the Gospel. I mean, you see the Old Testament, you see the Epistle, and you see the Gospel. Now, when I was back in seminary, one of the things we were taught was when it came to the lectionary. It, and by the way, the lectionary is a wonderful tool for pastors to have. It gives us kind of a way to make sure that you hear the most essential teachings of the scripture every single year. And the other reason is it kind of protects you from the pastor, because otherwise the pastor can get stuck on his pet topics and you're like, oh, we've heard that text about 20 times now. So that's part of the reasons you have it. But one of the things we're told in seminary is when you get to one of the readings, sometimes you'll see a random gap in verses. And if you do that, if you see that, your very first thing to do is see if, what it is and figure out why. Now, sometimes it's because they're trying to shorten up the text and speed up the service. Sometimes I have no clue why they get a cut out. But then we get weeks like this week. Do you notice there was a gap? And probably if you heard the epistle lesson a little bit ago, it seemed a little weird. You just read those words, all of a sudden dot, 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 and then pick up in verse 30. And so I had to look up and see what is in there. And I know exactly why it is not read. It's because it's a verse that if it comes up, it creates questions. And unless the pastor is nutty enough to preach on it, he doesn't want to address the questions. And apparently I took crazy pills, so I'm gonna, <laughs> we're going to talk about it. But 1 Corinthians 15, verse 29, it says, this is Paul writing, What do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? So what is the big question out of that verse? What does Paul mean by baptism on behalf of the dead? Now Mormons have an idea. They think they know what the answer is. They think that this is Paul telling us that if somebody dies in the f dies without having baptized, being baptized, then you could be baptized on their behalf. That's what, Paul, that's what some of the Mormons think. But there's not really good credibility to this. And so last week, I, I, pull, I have a very fa a nice fancy computer program called Logos. And it's got all sorts of Bible commentaries. And so I started digging through all of them to find what are the ideas as to what this verse means? 
And after, I was able to find about 30 pages at least of comments on one single verse. For example, Concordia Publishing House has a series called Concordia Commentary. They're all blue volumes. And they have about two pages dedicated just to this one verse. Martin Luther wrote an entire sermon on it. So did St. John Chrysostom, who was one of the great minds of the early church. And there's a whole Lenski, who's another one of the great commentaries of the last hundred years, dedicated quite a bit of time to it. And the thing is, as I went through it, apparently there's about 40 different theories as to what it means. Yes, 40 theories as to what baptism on behalf of the dead is. And then I found in this one commentary to cut it down to 13. And a few of the answers are kind of interesting. But the thing is, as I began to study it, as I was reading it, the thing I realized is two things. One is I know a whole lot more about this verse. And two, I still don't know what baptism on behalf of the dead is. And to take comfort, I don't think any of the commentaries knew what it meant. Because it is one of those scriptures that we just can't seem to get. There are a lot of passages in the Bible that you just, I don't think on this side of earth will we ever know. And it seems to be that Paul is addressing an issue that is very unique to the church in Corinth. None of the other churches had this baptism on behalf of the dead. And make it even more confusing is Paul is neither, is neither approving of the practice nor rejecting of the practice. He is just saying it happens. So a question might be wondered, since I don't, have, I don't totally know what the baptism on behalf of the dead is, why dig into it? Why bother with that verse? Because while I don't quite know what baptism on behalf of the dead is, I do know why Paul wrote those words. I know his intent. He says it right there. He says, if the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? So his whole issue is dealing with the church at Corinth who does not believe, that the, believe in the resurrection of the dead. And so that is all, the first Corinthians chapter 15, that entire chapter is Paul defending the resurrection of the body. And see, that is also why we will dig into a scripture, even to one little itty bitty verse, to get to know the fullness of scripture, the depths of our God. Because think about this reality. You and I, we were all born into sin. You were born dead. You were born an enemy of God. And the consequence of that sin is the inevitability that every single one of you will one day die. There's a, there's a nuance where there's an exception, but if you read farther in 1 Corinthians 15, there is an exception to the rule. But generally, we are all going to die one day. We don't know when. We don't know how. We do not know where. The minute you were conceived, you began to die. And so since death is inevitability for every single one of us, we look to a hope. We have a hope in the fact that there is a resurrection of the body. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul begins with these really wonderful words that is one of the earliest, the, probably the very first creed of the church. Where he, taught, he says that Jesus showed himself alive, risen from the dead, to over 500 people, to Cephas, Cephas means Peter, to James, to all, to the rest of the apostles, and to, as to one untimely born, he showed himself to Paul. Which, by the way, the, the dating of that creed 
Even atheists have acknowledged that that dates within a year of Jesus' crucifixion. Way, way too soon for myth or legend to develop. Within one year of his crucifixion, his followers were saying they saw him risen from the dead, which is quite profound. And by the way, that means the resurrection, the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus is incredible. But you see, stepping backwards, that Jesus became human flesh, born of Mary in that town of Bethlehem, in order to die by crucifixion, and in order on the third day to rise from the dead, and then on 40 days later ascend into heaven. He died and he rose to bring death to death, to bring an end to sin, to bring an end to the devil. That means that there is a resurrection of the body because Jesus rose from the dead. And because Jesus rose from the dead, those who have been claimed by him declared his children. So remember we began the service in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In baptism, you were clothed with righteousness. That was a guarantee, the seal of the promise that your body will on the last day rise from the grave. And by the way, that's why we don't call it a graveyard. We call it a what? Cemetery, which means, if somebody's heard it before, resting place. In other words, we, this is even why Paul says that many of these people have fallen asleep. In Paul's letter, he doesn't say that Christians died. He says they fell asleep. Because everybody that's in a cemetery, we expect them to wake up. That body in that casket will one day, Jesus will say to them, hey, let's go, it's time to get going. And they're going to wake up right out of that grave. And don't worry, it won't be like thriller or anything like that. It will be full, I, I just dated myself, didn't I? <laughs> Making a Michael Jackson reference. Anyways, but anyways, it won't be zombie, walking dead, night of the living dead. It will be a fully restored body. So if Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and there is a resurrection of the body brought about by his death and resurrection, that means he is your Lord. He is your Master. And that is why we dig into the Scripture. Because if he's your Lord and Master, you're going to want to know everything about him. Because you're going to want to know everything about his word, about who he is, so you can live in a way that is reflective of the fact that he is your Lord and Master. It means, if you, by the way, if you have not, I, I don't, random advertisement for the Ida County Courier for this week. I don't know if I'll get any um, money for that, but... If you have not looked at the newspaper this week, uh, Brent Harm wrote a really wonderful article about Mission Central. If you've ever been to Mission Central, Missionary Gary always tells Christians that they are to be what? Not normal. Not normal. And so if Jesus is your Lord and Master, that means you are going to do not normal things. Not normal things like what you heard in the gospel lesson. Doing, loving those who don't love you. No, he's loving your enemies. Doing good to those who don't do good to you. That means lending to people without expecting anything in return. That's unusual. That's not the way the world lives. You're only supposed to do good to those who do good to you, we're told. It means that we don't live as if with the mindset, well, drink, eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow I die. No, we are living not for this life, but the life of the world to come. And so again, we are in his word. That's why sometimes you might gather with, you might be able to gather at Subway at 6 o'clock on Thursdays. And by the way, if you come... I might even buy you a sub. 
or a soup or whatever. But we dig into God's word. And yes, sometimes we get to passages where I don't know what to, I'm like, I don't know this one. Back a couple weeks ago, out of 1 Timothy, we got to a passage, and I had to go and pull out all my commentaries later that week to figure out what it is. And I'm still not totally certain. But there's a lot of those passages. And guess what? Don't be afraid to go learn the Bible because well, I just don't know anything about it. I don't know a lot. It's like, that's why you go. It's because you don't. Could you imagine if a pastor did that? Like, I, imagine if I decided, I don't know 1 Corinthians 15, 29. I'm not going to read the Bible anymore for the rest of my life. Wouldn't that be nuts? No, you keep learning. You keep digging. Do you know when you can stop digging into the Word of God? It's when you know all of it. And do you know when you're going to know all of it? Never. Which means you never stop digging into it. So you keep meeting with your brothers and sisters in Christ, whether it be at Subway or it be at Zimmy's on Wednesday mornings or here on Wednesday mornings or with the LWML ladies or maybe if you're going to Sunday school or whatever or Bible class right after fellowship hour this morning. You come and you dig into God's word again and again because he is your master. He is your Lord. And you want to know all about him. And you want to know how to live in accordance with his will. In Paul's letter there in 1 Corinthians, he also talks about if the dead are not raised, why is he being devoured by beasts? You see, the reality is, is there is no salvation outside of Christ. That's controversial. There's actually a recent study that showed about 66% of evangelical Christians believe that Jesus is not the only way to salvation. Which that is a very, very scary reality. Which interestingly, atheists are wise on us when we believe that and they say, well, why do you believe in him at all? If you could be saved by any means, why even bother? And furthermore, why was Paul getting devout, being attacked by beasts if people could believe what they want. The apostles all died because they knew the only way to that resurrection of the body is Jesus. And they also know that we are, they were surrounded and so are we surrounded by people who are perishing. People who even bear the they claim to be Christian but as far as you could tell they are not living they're not acting, they're not talking as if Jesus is the Lord of their life. Namely, he really isn't. The word, fancy word we use for this is nominal Christian. Christian in name only. We, so you learn God's word that you may deliver it unto your neighbors. Deliver it unto those who are in your lives. That hymn we just sang, which I know was kind of a rough one, especially right in the middle there. It was kind of tough to, to sing. And interestingly, this is one of those weeks that all of our hymns are actually, hymns are written last hundred years. So they're actually kind of pretty, in hymn terms, they're new. But anyway, so the last verse, it says, O Spirit who didst once restore thy church that it might be again, the bringer of good news, Breathe on thy cloven church once more, that in these gray and latter days there may be those whose life is praise, each life a high doxology, to Father, Son, and unto thee. Yes, we are called to be not normal, <coughs> learning God's word, gathering on Sunday morning, waking up in the early hours to come and worship God, to hear his word, to receive his sacrament. It means that we are loving and kind. We are patient, gentle. It means that when people, our brothers or sisters sin, we forgive them. And it means that when we, we fail, which we do over and over, we come again and again to receive forgiveness for the strengthening of our faith so that we could go back out and serve him as he has. 
But it also means that our goal, and I'm going to hijack a phrase from the last two years, our goal should be a new normal. Our goal should be that the not normal is the new normal. That the normal is that all may confess Christ as Lord. That all may join us in the resurrection of the body and the life of the world to come. That's why you are here. As not normal. As, as aliens. As strangers in this world. You are here to bring the gospel to others. That they be, may be not normal as well. And guess what? If everyone is the same not normal, guess what? Now it's the new normal. That should be our goal. May it be our goal. Digging into passages like 15, 1 Corinthians 15, 29, and there's a whole list of others. May, we, may God be the Lord in our lives. And may we proclaim his glory to our neighbors in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. The grace, peace, and mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, keep you in the one true faith, the life everlasting. Amen. Please stand.